Ladies and gentlemen, we're here in New York City at the Roosevelt Hotel with my wife's boyfriend. We're going to try to get him a free hotel room for the night because the migrants should not get priority over my wife's boyfriend. Let's see what they say. No. Oh, we're here trying to get him a room. No, no, he cannot. Yo, no, we're trying to get him a room. Hey, we're trying to... We're trying to get a room. We need a free room for him. No, wait. We need a room for him. Yeah, no, I know he. Wait, why not? No, no, no. We got to get a room. Hey, dude, he's not going to cook any rats. He's not going to cook any rats like these Venezuelans. Dude, we need a room. We need a room. Back up. You cannot come in here. Come on. They won't give him a room. I don't know why they won't give him a room. Wait, is it because he's not Venezuelan? Is that why he can't get a room? Wait, I heard they got free hotel rooms. Are you paying for your hotel room? Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Don't touch me. Let's go. Get out. Guys, hey, look, all these immigrants get free rooms, but they won't get my wife's boyfriend a room. Look, they get to come to America. You got a free room. Where are you from, Venezuela? Do you get free rooms? Do y'all get free rooms? Did you get a free room? Did you guys get a free room? How much did y'all pay for your hotel room here? It's free. Why can't my wife's boyfriend get a room? El es el que está grabando a los migrantes aquí afuera del trozo. They get a free house. Can you get a free house? Hey, I know, but you broke my microphone. I'm trying to get him a room. What? It's a hotel. It's not a hotel for y'all, man. What about homeless people here in America? The fentanyl crisis, all the people overdosing. America has problems too, buddy. I mean, so ridiculous. So refined, I got no time for no games. Ask yourself why would I make time for you lames? At all costs, all costs. cause I'm a boss. I'm a break them off, yeah, gotta break them off. Ladies, girls, children of all age, look who it is, your boy from 99 in the hospital. It's not all fun and games, believe it or not. Um, even a pimp on a blimp sometimes, you know, has a malfunction. You know, need some maintenance done. And that's why I'm here at the hospital. You guys, you guys can see how lovely this place is. Paige is here taking care of a pimp. And uh, no, this is real. This is not fake. This weekend, my heart was just hurting me all weekend in New York. And um, I went to, so long story short, let me just tell the story real quick because we got to get to the micro interview, but I'd like to talk for five minutes about it. Um, I did the boxing match in November. We won that fight versus Mike Harrington. If you guys remember that, that was a big deal. But um, after the fight, my chest was a little sore. My chest was a little sore before the fight. The reason why I bring that up is I was like 218, I think, when I did that fight. I've gained like 35 pounds since then, which is not good. I got to get on my diet, which now I'm motivated now more than ever. But um, the pain from that, it would hurt when I like move my chest. It hurt like... It was, you could tell it was a bruise. This weekend on Friday, I was going on an airplane. I just started sweating right before. I knew that was weird. Like my body was just feeling wrong. And then all weekend, I was just having like small pain in my chest. Just like a little bit of like, not even sharp pain, like a light, dull pain, but just uncomfortable. Right. And uh, so yesterday it was freaking insane. I don't even know how to say this because it was actually really scary. Um, my dad's like, you guys, you got to go to the paramedic, Alex. If you're really complaining, you really, if you really that feel that tired, I felt really tired, like so tired. I still feel really tired. And um, I went to the paramedics. They put an EKG machine on my heart. And I'm telling you, when they got the paper that came out, they 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 strapped me down immediately. They said, we got to go to the hospital. We got to go to the hospital. And I said immediately, I, what what's going on? They're like, yeah, your EKG shows you're having a heart attack. I'm like, what? They're like, oh, we might go to Baylor. Baylor's a hospital where my mom died at. So I'm like, no, no. So now I'm fighting with them while I'm supposedly having a heart attack, of which hospital to go to. Luckily, they take us to a different one. I don't need to dox it right this second. But we didn't go to Baylor Hospital. Um, 
But then when I get to the hospital, they do an EKG and my heart is, it's not showing a heart attack. So the heartbeat irregularity was gone. So now they want to keep me in here for a day or two for testing. I did a CT scan. I did a blood test. I don't have the tripitone. So they said it was not a bad enough heart attack where, you know, it created some enzyme. So they don't really know. They don't really know. But I do know that I'm not 100%. I'm a pimp on a blunt. But guys, this is proof. I'm never going to ever find an excuse not to come live and talk to you guys because I care about you as much as I care about my family, as much as I care about the cats, as much as I care about anything else is doing this show. This is like my football game. Would a football player play injured? Yes. So I'm going to host a show injured. I mean, Jimmy's probably going to try to sabotage it tonight. I'm sure he's going to mess up some sort of way, but that's just what he does. Uh, Brandon hopefully can kind of keep him in line. But I just want you guys to know that this is not a joke, even though I think we should try to laugh about it a little. Like like before we get into the interview, let's see. What time is it? Pre how much time we got? It's 6.06, so we still got some time. But um, let me show you guys where – this is where I've been pooping in this room. I've been getting the gloves. The, hate, the nurses hate this. I get the gloves, and I go like this. They hate when I do this, and I scare them really bad. I go – will you hold this on me? Let's see if I – how do I flip the camera? Uh, let's see. Switch camera. Okay. Okay. Hold it on me. They hate this. They hate this. And then you go, I try to throw it at them. But yeah, they hate, they hate, they're like, Alex, you're wasting supplies. We're going to bill you for that. I'm like, y'all better not bill me because I'm trying to do some sort of insurance fraud. I, I'm not even Alex Stein. I'm in, in here. I'm, I'm Gary Benedetti, <laughs> if y'all ask. So I'm not paying all these prices. All right. So, and then we sometimes we get the, we've been getting it. The nurses get so mad when I go like this. They get pissed. And then I'll like, I'll come in here. Let me show you where this is where I've been pooping. I come in here. This is my favorite room. And this is where I like to shower. I sit here. I just kind of, I just take a shower. And I wear my shower cap. So I don't get wet. So yeah, it's actually a pretty good stay. It's, uh, I mean, is it five stars for a five star pimp? Yes. So, I mean, you know, it's not that bad. But, um, the computer, they hate it when I get on here. They hate it when I do this. The nurse is like, stop messing with the computer. I'm like, shut up, shut up. I know, I'm a techie. I know, let me get on here. I'm trying to go to Facebook.com. They're like, sir, don't use the computer, go on Facebook. And I'm like, who's paying uh, $1,800 a day room rental? That's not even all the medicine you're giving me. Me, so if I want to serve Facebook, we're on Facebook.com. Oh, I restart it too all the time. So they're late as you restart. Like, Why is your computer restarted? It's y'all's fault for letting me have a heart attack. So, also, little tour of the good old. It might be too washed out, but there's a beautiful airport here, Love Field. So, to say the least, you know, I might be dying. I might be on my last leg. But I just want you to know that I did not get. I don't. I don't want to say because we're on YouTube, terms of service, but the. COVID-19 thing that you think I got that caused this is not. I got this from hard work, from hustling, from grinding, from being in the club in the VIP section. I got this heart attack from being VIP in every top nightclub from Dallas to Phoenix to Arizona. Well, that's a state, but you know what I mean? I'm just saying from every nightclub from Dallas to Phoenix, I've been VIP. So that's why my heart is bad. We're doing fentanyl, we're doing this, we're doing that. So yes, so do not blame this on that. Do not blame this on the Fauci. This is not. This is the Charlie Sheen. I got the Charlie Sheen. So I was saying this earlier. Next up, AIDS. So, well, with all that being said, I'm going to, uh, how much time do we have? What's the chat saying? I'm still surprised that glove fit on your head. What? Yeah, the glove does fit on my head. They, <laughs> they get mad. It is Jimmy's fault that we're in the hospital. Wait, should I get another glove? Is that the XL? That was small. Hey, wait, watch when I do the large one. This is the one they really hate. Yeah, you gotta. Well, your head's just so big. My head is very big. <laughs> oh my god! This is how we party, guys. I come in here and I just look how good my food is. Dude, room service. I ate it all. Look at this. You ever seen this? Tomato. Mmm. 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 Oh. Mm. Yeah. Not good. Mmm. I need to wash it down with a little bit of ketchup. This is good for my heart. Mm. Mm. You just ate another tomato. Mm-hmm. 
tomatoes with ketchup. So extra healthy. <laughs> Boom. You guys want to see this? This is sometimes. Oh, they have toothpaste. Look at this. Y'all ain't never seen this. Y'all ain't never seen. <laughs> How many times y'all watch a podcast? Tell me this. Right now. How many times have you ever been on a podcast and you saw a man brush his teeth? I can't get this thing off. Hold on. Mm. So I'm the first person to ever brush his teeth on live TV. Mmm. 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 Boom. So, guys, going to the hospital, it's not all bad. It's not all bad. You get free toothpaste. Well, it's not free. You pay. It's, you pay 11 times the amount that this costs in the store, but worth it because, look, well, we're here in the hospital. So, before we get the show started, Jimmy, how long is the interview with Mike Rowe? I'm probably not going to be able to hear him. It doesn't matter. I'm going to probably get off, gotta get off the mic in the next couple of minutes. Okay, so I'm about to go. Watch the entire show. I'm going to be hopping back in randomly and 100% at the end. So we're going to do something crazy at this hospital here in about 46 minutes. So make sure to watch this entire interview with the legend himself, the host of an iconic show, Dirty Jobs, starring Mike Rowe. He's the people's champ. He is a good representation of middle-class America that is trying to help the generation that is coming up by not lying to them and saying that you got to go to a four-year college. What Mike Rowe is doing is he's actually teaching kids a skill that can make them money and make them successful so that they can have a better life. So thank you, Mike Rowe. Hope you guys enjoy this interview. I am going to be okay. I got the freaking things all over me. I got the freaking thing. I got the thing on my heart. So... If it starts acting bad, the nurse will come in and they'll zap my titties again. So, hip on a blimp. I'll be back here shortly. Let's play this interview. Ladies and gentlemen, we are honored to have an incredible legend in the studio today. He's the former host of Dirty Jobs. Please welcome on the one, the only, Mike Rowe. Mike, how you doing? Please, take your seats, everyone. Take your seats. Thank you. You're really legend. Yeah, you're an iconic TV host. Uh, what are you talking about, Mike? You're so humble. Don't be humble. I'm Primetime 99 Pimp on a Blimp. I want you to be um, uh, the dirtiest guy in the world. I want you to embrace it, Mike, instead of being so humble. There's a... Well, thanks. I'm going to work on that. But managing expectations. Mm -hmm. Had I not managed expectations properly, right from the start, I never would have worked my way up to be a guest on this show. <laughs> From the very beginning, like if, 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 if from the very beginning. This is the pinnacle, Mike. You made you it. Look, if you look back at the first episode of Dirty Jobs, it, it, it begins exactly the way the last episode did, which was, my name is Mike Rowe. This is my job. I explore the country looking for people who aren't afraid to get dirty, hardworking men and women who do the kinds of jobs that make civilized life possible for the rest of us. Now get ready to get dirty. If you think about that, there is no promise at all that anything good is going to happen, <laughs> right? It's just like, yes. this is my name, I'm gonna explore the country, I'm gonna look for people, I'm not even gonna find them, I'm just gonna look for people, yeah. that, that's all. So anyway, I've always tried to manage expectations. Now this next half hour is gonna be, I mean, let's just admit it, it's gonna be amazing. Yes, it is, the most amazing half hour we've ever had. But if we come right out of the gate and say, folks, what you're about to see is gonna completely redefine your expectations for this program. Sets us up for failure. They're gonna lean in and they're gonna be like, okay, right? And uh, who needs that kind of pressure, really? No, you're right, but before we even get into all the festivities, why, why didn't you ever go and do the dirtiest job, which is being a politician? Because there, there are really only two kinds of dirty jobs. There's the kind of disgusting, vile, putrid, soul-deadening, horrific sorts of vocations that at the end of the day, you can take a shower and you're all shiny and new. Yep. And then there's politics. Can't wash that stink off. <laughs> that's, that's, that's gets on the inside, Yeah. right? And so there's not, there's not enough, uh, people always used to ask me what kind of what kind of soap I used and what kind of detergent? <laughs> That's I, a good question. I, we should have wrote that. What kind of soap did you use? Did you use what? A gan or dial? What did you use? Uh, why would I use dial? I don't know. Why, why, That's why the only soap I can think of. Why would of. you say that? I don't even know soaps. I don't know. Sure you do. There's, there's uh, Irish ivory. Irish Spring. Irish Spring. Ivory. Yeah. Oh, God. I loved Irish Spring. You know, 
You're a strong man, Brian. Aye, a mite too strong. Shower <laughs> up with this. Irish spring. I used to love it, but no, I used uh, lava soap. Okay. It lava was great. Because it came, literally, it's like pumice. I mean, it would, it would, you could get anything off your body with lava soap. Well, speaking of dirty jobs, and before we get into your foundation, I wanted to introduce you to Tiny. He is my personal chef and what he specializes in. Actually, matter of fact, Tiny, why don't you tell Mike what you specialize in making? I specialize in cooking prison food for prisons. Nice. Yeah, so I've been his personal chef for about 10 years yeah. now. Okay, we got to get the camera on you. Okay, let's, uh, uh, is, are we having issues? With, oh, gosh. So now that camera's not cooked. So we'll get back to you, actually. Okay, gotcha. No problem. Have you ever, have you ever eaten prison food, Mike? You know, I, I think I have. That's a new genre on the internet where people are getting out of jail and have huge TikToks, TikTok accounts where they'll make Laffy Taffy out of coffee creamer. Oh, I, I don't know that. I just know I, I had lunch once in San Quentin, mm -hmm. and I had lunch in another prison. I forget the name of it. It was somewhere in Arkansas um, with the guys. You know, we just, we're just having a lunch. So in I kind in the chow hall. So I kind of felt like that was prison food, right? I mean, technically tiny, right? I mean, it would have to be. It's food, and I'm in a prison. That's gotcha. ergo. You've had prison food, but what we're doing here is we have our own dirty chef making some of the dirtiest recipes in the world. So, Tiny, you will you tell Mike a little bit about what you do and what you make? Today, I'm gonna make one of uh, Alex's favorite foods. Hmm. And baby, it's called hood rat waffles <laughs> you know, basically you know uh you know alex is from the hood so in every hood gotta have some kool-aid in there sure and, you know when he was a kid you know he used to feed these waffles uh to little rats in his house when he was chat a rats our audience yeah. is chat rats i love rats i have oh, a rat it's extraordinary See, it's very weird and i like cats which is doesn't really make sense very hypocritical but yes i like both animals yeah we also have a pancake and waffle mix we also have some monster for energy hmm a little sweeten in there with some Snickers. One of Alex's favorite candy bars growing up. This is so different than yeah. the Glenn Beck program. The this is a most... little different. And yeah, it's telling the, tell them the two secret two ingredients. Two of the secret ingredients is our shell shock gummies. CBD gummies. Nice. CBD. CBD gummies and... And then the cast brew coffee. And that's Dark double coffee. That's double caffeinated, so it's mm. extra strong. So Tiny, why don't, you, why don't you start whipping up and start you stirring go. it up and we'll catch in, we'll, uh, you know, we'll catch up with you. Okay, sounds good to me. So, no, 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 wait a minute. How, how did you meet Tiny? How, how what? In prison. <laughs> I'm a bail bondsman. No, seriously. Right. Yeah, no, my father, I've been a bail bondsman. That's the dirty job. Have you ever gone on a bail? Well, you've done bounty hunt. I have, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. But yeah. I don't think you did bail bond. You did bounty hunt, but you didn't do we, bail bond. We did uh, repo. Yeah, uh, repo. And, and, and I rode with those guys. But no, I never did a show with a bail bondsman. Yeah, well, my dad, I'm telling you, the, one of the craziest stories of my life, and this is, we joke around on the show, but this is a true story. When I was, I was like nine or eight, I mean, I can barely remember this, but my dad wrote a bond for a cartel member. Uh -huh. How it works is it was a million dollar bond. You charge 10%. I think my dad charged 8% to give him a deal. So he charged him $80,000 of a million dollar bond. Cartel boss got out of jail. As soon as he got out of jail, he said, I want that $80,000 back. <laughs> And so my dad went to move to California for a month, and my mom and I stayed in Florida for a month because we were so scared they're going to come and get their yeah, money. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so we had to I would deal with stuff like that all the time. Cartel. I mean, we won't do anybody that's had, like, you know, crimes against a child or something, but, like, we do all kinds of involuntary manslaughter. Sure. I deal with murderers all the time. No kidding. Yeah. And I should have done some more research. This is terrific. Well, then I know it's not. That's why I'm so screwed up. I grew up in a bail bond office, Mike. It's not... But we're sitting in a couple of easy chairs. Tiny is making your favorite food. Life is good. You're talking to a, a living legend, yes, an sir. icon, yes. uh, I think is how you put it. Yeah, I didn't say that, but you are. I, uh, but you are an icon. Paige, didn't he say icon? Did I say, like an I, icon of TV? I said iconic. Yeah, I guess I did. You know better than me, Mike. You're much smarter than me. I apologize. Well, look, I got a podcast now, and I'm just thinking, you ever get to L.A., come on it. You'd be I'm a coming terrific, to L.A. You'd be amazing. Do not. Do not say that and not follow through, because I'm going to go to L.A. ASAP, Mike. It's an honor to talk to a man well, of your caliber. Well, don't go there before I get back. Okay, yeah, I can't do anything. <laughs> Let me get back. Well, take I was going to be breath. waiting in your house for you, <laughs> just <laughs> sitting in the kitchen, like with Tiny. We we're going to make you some prison waffles. <laughs> if I had an agent, I'd, I'd have a word with him right now. <laughs> yeah, you would. You would, because... <laughs> Uh, well, speaking of your house, you know, that is one thing, Mike. You're a very wealthy man. You've made some money. Literally but, hundreds of dollars. But you still live in a very modest mm. apartment. Is that true? No, it's not true. I actually got out of it after 16 years. No, so you did. You finally got out of that place? Yeah, it's, it's, I, I live in a less modest 
place now. Uh, but yeah, I've all my life really, I bought a house when I was young, like a, in Baltimore City, mm -hmm. you know, and then I and then I sold it, and then I rented until I was I don't know, like just a couple of years ago. So your whole life, I mean, pretty much my whole life. Yeah, I was I I, I rent every. I've never you bought just like a new. The ease of it, why? Just because it's easier. I don't like. Uh, uh, I'm not properly acquisitive. Yeah. I don't. I don't collect things. Historically, I've never owned a lot of things. So you're not a hoarder. I'm not a hoarder. Oh, my dad is a he's a Belmont and a hoarder. We have stuff. For, oh my gosh. So you've never have you ever gone to a, a did you ever do that job where they I go have and done. clean they clean the hoarders? I did a, yes. We've done a number of people who went on Hoarders was one of those shows that came out of dirty jobs. Oh, it was kind of a spin-off. They got the idea from watching you guys. Well, there there were a total of something like thirty six or thirty eight shows that actually came out of dirty jobs, yeah. e either directly or indirectly. Wow, you're talking about just the idea or actually people from your show left and they followed that idea? And Both, okay. so that the, there was a guy called uh, Bill Bretherton who had a company down in, I think Baton Rouge or some part of Louisiana uh, called uh, Vexcon. Okay. And that show or that segment turned into a whole show that ran for years on A&E called Billy the Exterminator. Oh yeah, of course. So yeah, that yeah. guy came like straight from Dirty Jobs. But the other, like, it's like if you've seen Swamp People or Big Shrimpin. And you were the voice of Deadliest Catch, yeah. obviously. And that, by the way, we just started, that's season 20 coming up in a couple of months. I just started narrating that yesterday. And how long do you have to sit in the studio to do that? I mean, did you do the whole season in like in a couple days? No, I've done shows like that. How the Universe Works goes like that. Uh, but Deadliest Catch is almost, they almost crash to air, right? Okay. So they'll, they'll do yeah. 23 and I'll do the first three to get them like a three week head Pushing, start. Yeah. And, then it's, and then it's every week, which doesn't, I mean, like operation like this, you guys move pretty quick. <laughs> uh, Discovery's different. And they have to edit. This is, we're live to tape. I mean, the editing is much different. You know, this is so much easier. But I'm an expert in reality TV. Sorry, I'm pointing at you like this, but. No, I didn't know. I, I have to admit this, and I can only say so much because I signed an NDA, but I worked for the legendary television show Cheaters, where we catch people cheating on their husbands. And sure. Wives. And I want to say that show is 1 billion percent real if uh, any of the lawyers from the show is watching it. <laughs> but you seem and uh, complain that reality TV is getting too fake. And I tend to agree with that. Well, sure, man. I mean, there, there are very few. I mean, I, I'm not totally up to speed on the whole discography of cheaters. Uh, <laughs> but I've seen enough of it to know that, yeah, those people are probably realish. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, but what, like, Cops was real. Cops was real, and that was one of the greatest reality shows ever. I think so, too. And, um, you know, modesty aside, we, we never did a second take on Dirty Jobs. Yeah. We just, we just didn't do it. And in those days, like 2003, that, that show went on the air, it was, uh, it was a battle to get a behind-the-scenes camera on. I called it the truth cam mm -hmm. because I didn't want it just to be a show about, you know, exploding toilets and misadventures and artificial insemination or whatnot, <laughs> which, which are great, by the way. Those very highly rated programs, but... The artificial insemination is the, probably the most famous one, right? Yeah. I mean, it's the one everybody... Well, I think we have a clip from it. I mean, it's the one everybody talks about. There's a cow in Indianapolis that still calls me, man. <laughs> <laughs> and the bull, actually. <laughs> oh, wow, okay. Yeah. Well, they got no, no opposable thumb. They can't do anything. They just, right? They're, I mean, if you're, if you're going to collect from a bull then you need to really bring to bear all of the tools that God gave you to make that happen. That thumb is very important. Okay, before we get into your foundation talk, how much guilt do you have that you get to be micro superstar from doing dirty jobs, mm -hmm. but your cameraman had to do the same dirty job and not get the same acclaim? So I, my, my conscience is totally clear today, okay. but there was a time vis-a-vis uh, -vis our our last point where I did feel guilty and we were halfway through the first season and these guys were just getting creamed, man. They're probably getting it worse than you, arguably, because they have to get in the angles and stuff. So wouldn't well, they, they got to get in the hole first. Yeah, exactly. You want to get the shot of, oh, Mike's going in the hole. Well, yeah. poor Doug Glover, he's down there in the bottom of the hole. 
or by shout out Doug Glover. We want to give Doug Glover. Doug Glover was amazing. But before Doug, there was <laughs> this guy was amazing. His name was Bong Hung. So he's an Asian guy. No. <laughs> yeah. Well, I thought maybe he was a weed smoker. No, I said Bong. Bong was, I mean... uh, Bong was from Vietnam. And this guy actually never gets any credit. I never talk about him but because we were working on the pilot. But he was fearless. And he went into a, uh, a pumping station with me. This is right. one of these little concrete bunkers on the side of the road. You probably drove by one today, but you didn't, you didn't pay it any attention. because That doesn't look like anything. But, man, when you go in there... It, it's like four stories deep, and it's the seventh level of hell. And it's all the raw sewage from whatever community, and it just, it just fills up. We were outside of Wisconsin in this particular one. Anyhow, it was uh, maybe four feet deep, and he was going in there just to knock some of the cholesterol off the walls with a shovel, and it was 119 degrees, and... Inside the pump station. Inside the pumping so station. You covered a pool of poop and it's 100 degrees. You go down a ladder and then you're standing this deep in it and then you do the work. Well, anyway, Bong Hung went in first. And this was before we knew what the show was. We were just out and I was, I had an idea of what it was, but all I knew for sure is it's not the kind of show a cameraman is going to film from a polite distance. Yeah. You have to be in it with me. And, uh, and, Bong went in, and <laughs> I mean, it was such, it was such a, a, a mess. Uh, but he shot it beautifully, and and that footage really helped sell the show. So to answer your question, yeah, I felt guilty about all that. So halfway through that first season, I was like, "Give me the truth cam, because if Dirty Jobs is really going to work, it has to be a show about the making of, the of show. a show about work." And that's what. And once we got that dynamic worked out, the crew became characters. Yeah. Right. Like Tiny here. Yes, right? exactly I mean, you, you, right. You become, like, I mean, I like look at that shot you're using right there. That's the kind of shot I'm talking about. Where is it? Right, right up here. there. Right there, Mike. Right, right there. there. There it is. That's that's the true fly on the wall shot. That's the shot that lets your viewers know. It just reminds them of where you're sitting and what you're doing, and it takes all of. So to your point. That's why reality TV sucks by and large, because most of them for a long, 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 long time would never allow a, a shot like that. They don't want to break the fourth wall. Right, because, because reality TV started because the writers went on strike. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people who started working on reality TV were frustrated sitcom writers and they were actors and they were just people who wanted to keep working. And so they brought all of that like muscle memory with them and, and, and try, to, try to shoot like the way you would shoot a sitcom. But that's... That's not the real fly on the wall approach. Real. Yeah, that's not real. It's all fake. It's like these housewives shows. We like them, but, you know, they're all... They're not scripted, but they're all set up. And they're totally set up. And, and honestly, there's not much of a difference between scripting a show and, like, choreographing yeah. a show. You know, like, if you know where the action is going to go, then you're basically there to document a, a performance. But if you really don't know what's going on, like if they lead a bull over to me called Hunsucker Commando, <laughs> and a man opens up a tackle box and hands me a probe that's attached to a battery and tells me to insert that into the bull's rectum and then run current through it and then hold the styrofoam cup while I guide Hunsucker Commando, right? Like, like you, if, if you don't know any of that's gonna happen, and then it starts to happen, then you have just a whole, your cameramen are involved, man. Yeah. They're not just filming. They're, they're laughing with you. They're horrified with you. Like, no one knows what's going to happen next. And once the viewer <laughs> realizes that, then it's, it's more than a show. Then they're on the trip with you, and that's cool. Yeah, that's what they want. Okay, so tell us about your foundation, Mike. Why is college so bad? I know, and I, I got a degree from LSU, and I basically majored in getting drunk, vodka. I mean, you know, I got a degree, but that's really what I did. But tell us, why is college so bad, and why are, is a vocational school, a trade school, why is that so much better for the youth of America? Look, I would never, I would never say college is so bad or, or trade schools are better. What I would say is we've talked for decades to a whole generation of kids, like they're all the same creature. Mm -hmm. like, like you and Tiny and Jimmy and P 
page and be like, we're all the exact same creature, right? So we all hear the exact same thing. You know, if you don't get a four-year degree, you're, you're screwed. Yep. You're going to wind up turning a wrench. You're going to wind up crawling through a sewer. You're going to, whatever. So my complaint it, with regard to all this is just the cookie-cutter advice that screwed up a lot of kids. A lot of people, look, there's $1.7 trillion worth of debt on the books now. Yeah, rising every second. Yeah. Every second. There's over 10 million open jobs, most of which don't require a four-year degree. Mm. And we're still putting all this pressure on kids to take the most expensive path. That's dumb. Right? Very dumb. So my foundation, the guy that was just up on the screen there a minute ago, was uh, somebody who applied for a work ethic scholarship. We gave him one. And now he's a plumber. And now that's him. Sean, I think his name is. Um, so what I do today, yeah, Sean Kelly. I circle back and I talk to the people that we've worked with or helped yeah. learn a trade. And then I ask them like really hard-hitting probing questions like, how's it going? And, and they say things like, it's beautiful, man. I got, I got money in the bank. I got a family. I got no or, debt. Yeah, yeah. I got my second kid on the way, you know. That guy, his whole rap was, he's, he's like the happiest plumber in the world. He's in a great union. He works 40 hours a week. He, he, he's not entrepreneurial, but he's hardworking, and he's got a balanced life. You talk to another guy who's maybe an electrician who's got four guys working for him now, and they got a mechanical contracting company, and he's got his buddies who are into heating and air conditioning and carpentry and welding, right? So we've been at it. Like this foundation, it's called MicroWorks. It evolved pretty organically out of dirty jobs. And um, today we award these scholarships. We give away a couple million bucks a year. Wow. And we help train the next generation of skilled workers. So like the real shameless plug is me looking at this camera saying, go to microworks.org. Right Micro now. Do it now. Microworks.org. That's an order from the man himself and me. So it's a double order. Go there right now. And apply for a work ethic scholarship. And get some Cast Brew coffee. This is a terrific coffee and a sponsor. What's the show called again? Uh, Tim Pool, Tim Cast. Tim Pool, Tim Cast provides this coffee. A lovely guy. No, but I meant this show. What's the show? Oh, a Prime Time with Alex Stein. Prime Time with Alex Stein. <laughs> the only coffee worth drinking from Tim Pool. It'll make you poo. It will. And then uh, you're going to teach a plumber how to clean up the poop that I poop. So... Circle of life. Hakuna that, Makata. That is the circle of life. Okay, so now let's get really into the heavy hitting. Well, well I, I have a quick question for Oh, Mike my gosh. Jimmy, no. Jimmy, he's so, my producer. So I, I he have, always tries to interject in the show, well, Mike. You can yell at him and do I, I, Oh, my gosh. Uh, now I remember this guy. Yes. Yeah. You were sitting here. A wrestler came out and beat the snot out yes, of you. Yes. And it was he was doing that. <laughs> yes. That's yeah, I, I knew finally got my seen you somewhere before. Yes. Okay, so Jimmy, what do you want to say? He went to Princeton. He yeah, thinks he's so smart. I was going to talk about my $200,000 degree and now my boss is someone who went to LSU and majored in Coors Light so <laughs> did I get fooled Bud Light no. Bud Light excuse me <laughs> well yeah yeah you got fooled but the jury's still out right because something's going to happen to you in the next 5 10 15 years I have no mm -hmm. idea what it's going to be mm -hmm. but I promise you you will have learned something something will have stuck in the reptilian part of your brain from all that indoctrination you endured mm -hmm. at Princeton mm -hmm. that's actually going to pay off I don't know what it is but studies show that sooner or later, those kinds of squishy liberal yeah. arts degrees. Yeah, no, I graduated without becoming communist or transgender. That's so. not necessarily so that. true. That's not oh, necessarily that's, true because yeah, you're oh. five times vaccinated. You're a lot of, I mean, let's not. Seven. Yeah, okay. But Why take chances, Jimmy? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. He, Why he take does chances? It. He doesn't want to take any chances. <laughs> but th this is one thing his Princeton education taught him. Jimmy does... Uh, it's GSD, get shit done, excuse my language. Uh, he does get it done. Yeah. He does it wrong a lot of the times, and, you know, <laughs> he does it sloppily. <laughs> mm -hmm. He always turns in the assignment on time. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, does he have uh, what you call enthusiasm? He does, fake enthusiasm, but he has enthusiasm to get There's yeah, no difference. There's no, no difference between fake enthusiasm and real there we enthusiasm. Go. Alex, I loved editing this video. I loved editing. And then it's edited like a monkey did. No, I, and, I mean, literally, a monkey could edit it better. I mean, no offense to me, but. No, I do lie a lot. Well, that's a skill too. You know, look, if you're hey. going if you're going to lie, Jimmy, 
lie lie well yes exactly like right. oh alex i love it when you say i went to gay conversion therapy that do not never bring that up old. to mike because he's not he might be a mike pence fan okay my bad jimmy my bad, went my to bad. mike pence's gay conversion therapy and that's why he has yeah a that joke daughter. never gets old. he brings did it up really? every no but uh I may, <laughs> Wait, I did you just say really I did... <laughs> yeah he <laughs> believes it because mike's a smart guy was he it not tell. obvious i left a little bit of doubt in his mind he met me he's like oh i could see that jimmy you look like a gay conversion all therapy right let's go graduate. to other but that's stories let's Let's go. Uh, uh, let's get into the stories that we want to talk with you about. So, Mike, we want to go into. How long is this show, by the way? I'm it's curious. only only about twelve minutes left. Is so, that right? Yeah, yeah, no, I mean I got all the time. I'm just curious. <laughs> no, we're close, and yeah. we got a couple more bits we got to do, so we got to get through these. But no, I, wanna... I got my uh, stadium pal on, so I can sit here so all day. You're good. Okay, yeah. you got this. So he can go tinkle right in his shoe. That's what they got. Um, but speaking of your career, Mike, you really started off as a voice man. Yeah. Yeah, I did. The first uh the first time I got paid to like do something in in front of an audience was uh was actually singing. I uh I crashed an audition uh for the Baltimore Opera when I was 21. So you just walked in cold call it was like a cattle call audition? Or yeah, you... well the last Thursday of every month they would see anybody who wanted to sing for them and uh there was a loophole in this industry, right? I needed my SAG card mm -hmm. and my AFTRA card to work yeah. in the world I thought I wanted to work in. And uh, the only way you could get those is if you had an agent that would put you up for jobs. Or you get like a commercial or something. Yeah, it's hard. I mean, you right. have to know somebody. Yeah. But no agent would sign me if I wasn't in the union. And I couldn't get in the union if I hadn't done any union work. And I couldn't get any union work if I didn't have a union card. So anyway, the dodge was if you can get into the opera which is governed by another union called uh, AGMA. The, that gets you into after and You can SAG. buy, you can just pay your dues and get into SAG. So I thought, well, if I can get my AGMA card, American Guild of Musical Artists, then I'll buy my SAG card and then I'll be like a TV star, maybe movie star, right? It's simple, what could possibly go wrong? So I, uh, yeah, I audition and I get in. Ridiculous. And that's how you got your SAG card. That's how I got my SAG card, but that's a great story. You need to clip that. How Mike Rowe got his SAG card. People love how do they break into it. You know, Brad Pitt was an extra on yeah. Central Casting. You know, people love to know how did they get their But start. the difference between me and Brad, like... Nothing. You're better looking. Brad, Brad, Brad's had a pretty good run, but I think... Uh, I'm, I'm, no, Brad, look, he's Brad Pitt, for God's sakes. But he, he had the good sense to, to move on as soon as he learned that lesson. I stayed in the opera for eight years. No, so you sang for eight years, so you loved it. I sang for eight years, yeah. It was a lot more fun than I thought. Um, now, I did other things while I was doing that, but I, th I thought that was the point of your question. I started like impersonating a singer when I was young, and that really helped a bunch of, a bunch of different things. And then shortly after that, that's when I started narrating like these nature documentaries. Right, so it was a lot of Nat Geo and... Um, you worked for American Airlines on their show. I did, I did if you were on a, any flight on American Airlines over three hours, I was doing a show called On Air TV. I bet you got recognized from that a lot, right? Dude, I, I, I get recognized. Well, now, but I'm saying back then, I bet you got recognized from that. Well, yeah, but it was a totally different... But one of my favorite, oh my God, it's you, Mike Rowe stories, is this was like 1996. And I had done a show on American Airlines that took place in, I think we were in Johannesburg. Okay. And that's neither here nor there. We were flying back from someplace else, and I was wearing, I, I don't have a lot of clothes. I told you I don't collect a lot yeah. of stuff. I, 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 I don't have anything. So I, I'm, I'm wearing the exact same shirt and the exact same blazer, all right? And I'm sitting up front because I got a fancy pass because I'm working for American Airlines. But the bathroom was out of order, so I walked to the back of the plane to go to the bathroom. And the monitors are all hanging down from the ceiling, right? Yeah, because it didn't used to be on the seat. It used to hang down. People might not realize that. And as I'm walking from the front of the plane to the back, I'm on all of these monitors wearing the exact same outfit <laughs> doing a stand-up, so I'm walking toward the camera yeah. in the monitor, and then I'm walking toward the people watching the show on the plane. And so it looked like I fell out of the sky. And into the plane. Into the plane, dressed the same. And people in their chairs were like, ah! <laughs> 
why, why is this guy on the plane all of a sudden? Did they think it was like a practical joke? Or, I mean, I don't know. I don't know what they thought, but I was thinking, you know, I guess these people are starting to recognize. And I turned back, and I was like, no wonder, man. I'm scaring the hell out of them. Oh, that's good. Okay, so let's play this clip, and I want to get your instant reaction. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Holy crap. Who wants to clean and debone them? I'll do it. What gives? You want to do it? Just wait till you see what I've got. It's the Wonder Boner. <laughs> <laughs> the Wonder Boner? Oh, you laugh now. Just watch. You just assemble the Wonder okay, Boner stainless steel this. rods like this. This is uh, the hard work we do here at the Blaze. Sliding through the ring on the Wonder Boner and... Just that easy. Wow. Yeah. The Wonder Boner. My wife would like that. Introducing the Wonder Boner, the amazing new fishing tool that makes deboning fish a breeze. The Wonder Boner's unique design removes the bones from trout, char, and whitefish. Simply connect the appropriate yeah, size. That's me. That's, that's it. Rod. That's me. Great voice. That's, that's me telling you about the Wonder Boner the on an actual through. infomercial. It's that easy. And the Wonder Boner comes with a polyethylene storage yeah, case okay. that doubles yeah. as a base and a cutting. It's a real thing, man. That is a real thing. The yeah. one, did you ever use the Wonder Boner? I'm using one right now. <laughs> Thank you. Take your seats, everybody. You're very kind. Uh, so I, I, I wrote that. I wrote that. Ad. That whole commercial? That yeah. was funny. Yeah, I, I had a buddy. I worked for QVC for three years. I know, and you said I was reading about it. You kept trying to get fired, or they would fire you and hire you back all the time, and yeah. you finally just said bye. Right? I was fired uh, three times and spent most of my time there on a kind of double secret probation. You know? Trust me, I know. <laughs> I know I'm very well. I, I mean, well clearly, that, this yeah. is I, this is I'm a borderline PTSD for me sitting here right now. It's very QVC ish. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, there was no um, there's no training program for that back in those days. Anyway, if, if you could talk about a pencil for eight minutes, they gave you a probationary three month contract and put you on the air in the middle of the night. And if you could sell enough, well, if you just didn't go up in flames, you know, they kept you. And, and so I, I never really wanted the job. I just auditioned for that to settle a bet. But I got it. And uh, and one of the guys I met was just this hustler who had this idea for the Wonder Boner. He was a fisherman and, you know, so I said, yeah, I'll, I'll write an ad and next thing I know we cast these guys. We actually sold a lot of them. Yeah, and it looked like a good product. I mean, it deboned the fish pretty quick. The I mean, bones come right out of the fish, Alex. It's just this motion. If you can master that motion, show it to me again. I've mastered that, sadly, even though if my you, girlfriend's here, I've mastered you can do that, that it's... <laughs> that's, Okay, well, we got. We only have so much time left, Mike. I could speak to you all day, but we want to get into this clip. My producer's in my ear. We have to play the most legendary clip ever. Mm. Well, I mean, arguably one of the most legendary clips, the bull insemination. Oh, let's have a look. I think about baseball, and it goes on and on and on. <laughs> Bassy. Gosh. How did that cow crap on me three feet away? <laughs> this animal's been farting for 20 minutes. For most, it's a god-awful time of the morning. But for one man, by the time the sun rises, he's already put in a full and very intimate You can day. cut in any time. Let me tell you something funny about that. Yeah. Introduce We don't have time for the whole so clip. I don't know. I mean, well, see, that's better. amazing that you found that. But that's not from Dirty Jobs. Yeah, I know. That was from uh, the, sp the show that started that's Dirty Jobs. from the show that started. It was called Evening Magazine. Yeah. And I used to host that thing in San Francisco. And uh, one day, my boss was like, you know, let's kind of... I basically said I'd I'd like to I'd like to start hosting the show like not from wineries or museums but let's just go to different places. So, the first place we went was the sewer, and that was just horrified the audience. And then before anybody had the presence of mind to to fire me from that gig, I went to Harry Anderson's place there, and um, yeah, man. I mean, people are sitting down to eat their meatloaf and have a normal night, and suddenly a cow's farting. <laughs> Oh, I had my arm up to my elbow, and you didn't even see the stuff with the bull. That's like a German porno. You can't air that. No, even that's why. That's why I cut it off. No, that terms of service. That's you not allowed air. to be on YouTube. I don't think. But yeah, man, that was a, that. That was the first time I, I think anybody on. That's the first time that happened on on TV. You know, and, and that's why it was so groundbreaking because you were really the first person to go out and you know do that. We also had because that was technically a news station. You didn't have to worry about like musical rights and things. You could play any song you want. So I was like, I had like Love is a Many Splendored Thing. I had Beatles song. Like you could use anything 
Like that's a big deal. Yeah, and I know that makes the the sc scoring of it so different because it uh, sounds yeah. epic. It sounds like a movie when you have the real when you have like Rolling Stones. It's or, like the Righteous Brothers singing a love song as you violate a, a barnyard animal. Man, that that's very unusual. Unchained melody while you're fisting a cow. You know, you wouldn't know that's how. Another way to put it. Yeah. All right, so, Mike, we're almost done. I don't know if that's blocking his camera, Jimmy. Maybe is it a little, your Princeton grad? Honestly, uh, four years of Princeton, dude, and you're going to put uh, it right yeah, in front of the camera? that's what I'm saying. I don't know how. Me again. That's Jimmy. Okay. Right. <laughs> and, and, oh, look, are some of the waffles already done? Okay, well, we're, we're going to get to that last. So, Mike. Yeah. We were not going to have you here without having you do a dirty job. And if you if he looks at the monitor, he can see, uh, Jimmy, you didn't run through that very well. Well, I, I haven't put him here. I can't see him yet. Okay, well, we'll just have him close his eyes, scout on her. Okay, so now. Plus, I'm anchored to the chair with all this stuff, right? Can I get uh, up and move around? Up. Yeah, you can get up and carry right. in your hand. All right, so we're going to stand up right here. Yeah, I'm kind of anchored to the chair, too. We're going to stand up right here, Mike, and we play a game. You can put it, you can put the... We're going to have to put a glove on. We call this gloves. This yeah, is our this is our this is our dirty job. This is the bonus hole game. It's Alex's bonus hole. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna stick our hands into some mystery substances, and these are all street legal. Nothing, uh, nothing's gonna get you uh, hurt or injured, and you're gonna have to guess the yeah. substance. Great. Okay. And the substance we're going into Alex's bonus hole. Yes, you're going into Alex's bonus hole. Welcome to my bonus hole. All right, Mike. All right, uh, Jimmy, and then I guess we'll have to close our eyes or something because we're going to easily be able to don't, see. Just don't look at the, the monitor. Oh, my gosh. Okay, let's... Yeah. Jimmy. Yeah. So close your eyes. Close your eyes. All right, I'm closing my eyes. What's the first substance? Okay, okay. Mike, you can put your hand in first. All right. Hmm, let's see. I'm not even that far inside the bonus hole, <laughs> and I'm squeezing it. Get it, 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 it's, it's totally gelatinous. This is, uh, this is like a... I'm going to say it's a, it's a gelatinous gravy of some kind. That is ranch. Ah, ranch dressing. Close enough, close there enough. Okay, oh, now we don't have any napkins, Jimmy. Oh, it's yes, okay. we do. No, we just go with a, you just go with another glove, right? Yeah, you can just throw that glove away. Okay, now I'm closing my eyes. I'm gonna guess the substance. I'm an expert. I've never gotten this wrong, okay, ever. Okay. My eyes are closed, I'm not cheating. I'm gonna know this substance. Oh, this feels like, this consistency, this is ketchup! Oh. <laughs> You know what? When you're not sure, say it loud. Yeah, just be extra confident. Okay, Mike, let's see if you can guess the right, next right, substance. All right. Don't look, don't look. Don't look, don't look. I'm not sure. Let's see if he's going to be able to guess this. I think okay, he is. I think he is. I'm not sure gloves. <laughs> Help. Yeah, it kind of hurts. Well, it's definitely not ranch, I'll tell you that. <laughs> Probably not mustard. Let's see, what could that this be? This feels to me... <sighs> I'm going to say... It's a it's a ratatouille. <laughs> what? That's a movie, right? And that's yeah. a dish. That's a French that dish. A dish. No, uh, no, it's, it's mayonnaise. Oh, geez, yeah, it's very thick. <laughs> that is thick. Okay, now the next one. I'm going to do no glove, guys. I do not recommend this at home. You have to be a trained professional. I'm going to guess with okay. no glove. I'm You're risking. Bareback, are you? Yes, bareback. Commando. Let's. All right, no, no, okay. Oh, what go. was that? That was the leftover ranch. What is this, Jimmy? What is this? Is this? How many is it people watch this show? Man? A lot, a lot. Yeah, Seriously? we get millions of hits on the internet, believe it or not. Um, I'm gonna say this is ketchup. Yeah! I job. knew it. I told you, I never get it wrong. The first one that was an anomaly. All right, guys, we just did our dirtiest job ever. What is this bit called again, Jimmy? Uh, Alex's bonus hole. Alex's bonus hole with the legend himself, Micro. Okay, Mike, now we're almost done. Now we have to get to my favorite part of the episode. All right. Wait, what did you say in my ear, George? Yes, the pancakes. Now, this, if we can get Nate. If, if you're you... a lucky woman. <laughs> Paige, you are a lucky woman. She is. She is a very lucky woman. I'm a lucky man, to be honest, but he's a little lucky. So, Mike, you don't have to eat this. But this is my diet. It consists of the Kool-Aid. Real quick, just whip one up real quick. Okay, just, just, you don't have to cook it, but just show yes. them what, okay. what was in it. All right. So we mix a little bit of flour. Uh -huh. Here, here we can get the behind them. Yeah, let's get yeah. behind them. All right, a little flour. A little, better. a little flour. Some fruit punch. Some, fr some fruit Kool-Aid, Kool-Aid. And this is what they eat in prison. Yes, sir. They love it. How little, did you come up with the recipe? Awesome. Like, when did you figure this out? Oh, man, you know, just all types of ideas, just sitting around, you know. Think what prisoners might want to eat, man. Some sweet, look crazy. A little coffee there. A little sweet, a little crazy, a little coffee. And this is this is double caffeinated, prime time brew. Uh, double the caffeine. 
How'd you get your face off? Awesome. Exactly. That's, awesome that's a, that's stuff, a branded guys. coffee right there. That's a pimp on a blimp coffee. Huh. I gotta talk to Tim about this. Yes, we um, need a micro, dirty, dirty uh, coffee. Like or... a micro drip. Yeah, we oh, micro drip! Like micro yeah, drip. Oh. Like what's dripping in Alex's bonus hole? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Flip that. Good Flip job, Mike. <laughs> okay, so this is what it was. Now, now I'm going to be the first to, to try this. Jimmy, come here. Brandon, come here on set. I, these guys have to eat whatever I tell them. Yeah. Grab your fork. Part of my... Mike probably doesn't want to do I this. I didn't know that part of the contract. So, Mike, this is the most delicious food. Brandon, come here. Hurry. Oh, can, give me one of these. Yes, get one yes. of these. Okay, now we'll on three, it. we're all going to take yeah. a bite of this special, special waffle. In honor of Mike Rowe. Thank you, Tiny, for this delicious. No problem at all. Food. No problem. That's yeah, what I do guys for prisons. Spoil me. Y'all spoil me. One, two, three. Mm. Bon appetit. <laughs> That's not that bad. It's not terrible. No, it's not terrible. Tiny's prisoner food. I'm telling you, man, it's off the hook. Make sure you get some in you now. <laughs> Let's get Mike. <laughs> what you think, Mike? I don't. I don't know that I'll ever swallow again. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. The gummy in the center is kind of It's so good. Yeah, yeah. I eat all that. Mmm, mmm. Mm. It's amazing. This is so I'll delicious. You, man, that stuff is awesome. I have I'll the best you. prison chef in the world, Mike. Tiny's in the building. I'm telling you, get that recipe, guys. I'm telling you, it'll work for you. All right, guys, this has been a great show. Mike, before we go, tell the people how they can find you, find you and support you. Screw that, man. I know people at the Food Network. I'm going to change your life. <laughs> okay, With one phone call. Sounds all right. Good to me, man. Bobby Flay, never mind. <laughs> Million dollars to microworks.org. Go get some work ethic scholarships. Don't be a slacker. Now, I have to say, my last thing is you brought up Super Chef Bobby Flay. I was on a reality show called Worst Cooks in America. Uh -huh. Real quick, I'll tell you this story. The, the idea of the show. Get out of here. You guys get out oh, of here. I, I, had a, I had a 10 second question. Okay, well, then you can ask a 10 second question. Let me tell the story. I was on the show, Worst Cooks in America. Mm. They get bad cooks, they teach them how to cook. Bobby Chef, Super Chef Bobby Flay was the host. I gotta tell the story really quick. Long story short. I got eliminated from the show. It was me and a girl on the chopping block, and I said something so stupid. He asked me, why do, you, why do you deserve to stay? And the girl that I was competing against, even though there was like 12 people when her and I were on the chopping block, she had an eating disorder. And mm -hmm. she didn't know how to cook. That was her story. My story is I'm an idiot. I don't know how to cook. And I cut myself in the kitchen. During the audition, I cut my hand open. Mm. That's neither here nor there. When I'm on the chopping block, I don't think I was planning to go home. But I said this statement. He goes, why do you deserve to stay? I said, well, I have a better relationship with food than the girl. And Bobby Flay immediately kicked me off. Didn't ask the producer anything. He immediately kicks me off. And I was so mad. I was like, Bobby, why did he do that? He was my friend. The producer's like, you shouldn't have done that. Then, then before the show came out, no, there's a long story. I got to tell this story. It's so, so good. It, it really, it, it taught me a lot, this story. I was so mad at him. The Times picking you, and that's a New Orleans newspaper. They interviewed me before the show came out. They said, oh, how was your experience on the show? And I was all salty. I was like, Bobby Flay, you know, he's a great chef, but he... You know, he didn't care about teaching us how to, you know, cook. He's super chef Bobby Flay. I was not complimentary of him. <laughs> so I get a cease and desist from Food Network saying, do not do any more interviews just about the show unless we approve it, unless, like, it's one that we ask you to do. Like, like what you're doing right now, for instance. Kind of, yes, exactly. Okay. But get the cease and desist. I'm scared to death. And it goes to my dad's house, and so my dad sees it. So we're like, oh, we're in so much trouble. Fast forward, fast forward a year and a half later, my dad calls me to North Park Mall. That's the main mall here in Dallas. I have no reason. He's like, Alex. Get your ass here right now. I'm like, what is going on? This must be something crazy. I get to William Sonoma. There's a line wrapped around the door. I'm like, what is going on, Dad? It's Super Chef Bobby Flay's book signing. And he's doing an autograph meet and greet, right? And no I, way. And I was just on the show. It had been about a year, maybe a year and a couple months. And I'm sweating bullets. I'm so scared. Because my dad's like, I want to meet Bobby Flay. I want to meet Bobby Flay. And I'm like, Dad, you know, this could be bad. This could be bad. I walk in there. Bobby Flay treated me with so much respect, he made me feel this big for ever saying anything bad about him. He killed me with kindness, and for that, I respect Bobby Flay. I have nothing but the utmost respect. So I learned, you know, I said that, I spouted off, and I thought he was gonna crush me. He couldn't have been nicer, took a picture of my dad, couldn't have been extra nice, and way nicer then than he ever was on the show. Well then, in light of all of that, why don't we officially name these waffles and this whole concoction the Bobby Flay, homage, Alex, slash, Jimmy's bonus butthole special. Yes. Sounds good to me. All right, now my producer wants to ask you one uh, last okay, question. Okay. What is so, your question? You gotta get I, the I have a three-month-old baby, just came up, became a father. She pooped on me three times yesterday. <laughs> is being a dad the real dirty job? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I, 
I, I don't have any kids. Yeah, get out of here. <laughs> no, no, it's not. I don't know. Well, you can answer his question. Being a dad is not a dirty job. My dad didn't change my diaper once. Listen, there are so many different ways you can think about the business of deliberately pooping on your fellow man. And I, I don't know you need to limit it to, you know, are you related? You could probably bring it back to prison if we wanted to, right? I'm sure you've seen some things. Oh, yeah, I have. In the prison? Oh, so, most definitely. Yeah, look, man, that's, I'm not here to judge. Guys, the legend himself, Mike, thank you so much for joining us. I really owe you. This is nice our, our most nice iconic you, episode ever. Out, Everybody Mike. go Enjoy. to MikeRowWorks.org and go support this incredible man. And this incredible man, awesome. I can't even speak, because he's out there actually helping people and giving them a chance at a better life. So thank you for that, Mike. That's Thanks. nothing, really. Forget it. Too humble. You Come on, freaking... stop. Just managing expectations. All right, can I take this that's... for the road? Yes, sir. <laughs> Fantastic. And that's it. Thank Good. you, Mike. Good. All right, cut. We're done. All all right, guys, it is the Pimp on a Blimp, and I got some good news. Well, actually, I got some sad news before I say the good news. Part of the reason why I'm in the hospital, we got to give a big shout-out to Mr. Bocus. This is Tim's cat, a great cat. was a hero, a cat that I love very much. Um, so shout-out Casper Coffee, and shout-out Bocus. Uh, you're just a legendary cat. You know how much I love cats. And um, we got to say, guys, look, we're walking out of here. I get this free complimentary mug from UT Southwestern. It only cost me $9,874, and I get this free plastic mug. So if you ask me, I think it's worth it. So I'm out of here. I survived my first heart attack, probably the first of many. Let's be real. Oh, shoot, I spilled a little. Let's be real. I know. I just noticed it. Sorry. You, you got to notice that was one heart attack I survived. Probably going to have a couple more heart attacks. Um, but that's when you're a pimp on a blimp. You know, I'm going to have to survive heart attacks, stabbings, beatings. Um, everything. When you throw it at me, I'm going to survive because, you know, what doesn't kill me makes me stronger. And that's why I'm out here. The beautiful sun. I haven't been out here in days. I've been cooped up in this hospital. And now I'm finally free to be me at UT Southwestern. Let me see if I can find a sign that says it. Okay, let me run over here. Free. 15 minute wait limit. Okay, hold this. Okay, actually, let me drink this. All right, guys. Yo, yo, had a heart attack, survived that shit. I don't really care because I'm a number one pick. I'm a pimp on a blimp. UT Southwestern, I don't really care because you know, uh, what did I say? What did it rhymes the Western? Um, Western, Eastern. I don't know, guys. They had me on a bunch of pain medicine and I just, I'm just so happy to be out. I'm happy to be alive. So, Mike Rowe, thank you guys. I survived it. I got my Cancun bracelet. I've never taken off this bracelet. I've never taken off this bracelet until I go to Cancun again. All right, guys. I love you. This has been our show. Tomorrow night, Primetime's back in studio. I'm out of UT Southwestern. I'm out of here. And I'll be back on the blimp. Peace. See you guys tomorrow.